gospel track to tell you about Jesus. How you doing, man? I'm going to give you a gospel track to tell you about Jesus. You're welcome. You're welcome. Being out here spreading the word. Oh, sure, sure. You go to church somewhere? Oh, uh, yeah. Where do you go? Um, I'm an Anglican, so I go to Lakewood Anglican here, but I'm not from around here. I'm from Toledo. Okay. I'm My wife from is from that area. Nice. Um, her family grew up in, well, in Finley area. So from I grew up in this area. So when I go out there, it's like country. I have to have the GPS to know how to get to her, yeah. her family's house. Um, but uh, yeah, so you you go to an Anglican church, huh? Yeah. That's interesting. You know, um, I don't know where Anglicans have gone from from the early understanding of Anglican church. Yeah. I know I have some friends. We do street preaching, and there's a um, one of the guys that runs Sports Fan Outreach International. He's Anglican. And so that's about my extent of knowing what they are today. I know it used to be you had the Anglican Church, you know, reformed somewhat. I don't know if they're still, you know. Uh, well, is he Anglican or Episcopalian? Because there's a difference. Well, I mean. Okay. Well, didn't the Episcopalian was kind of like um, uh, the same type of church in a different context or different area? Like yeah, you talk so about England Republican. and then America? Yeah. So Episcopal Church is like the American version. Yeah. But um, there's been a lot of controversy within the Episcopal Church, especially with, you know, unorthodox teachings and sometimes straight up heresy. So there's a group that split away in like 2000, I mean there have been a few, but the biggest one split away in like 2009 called the Anglican Church of North America. And their goal is to restore Anglicanism back to its true traditional and biblical roots. That's the one that I go to. Okay. Yeah. So then you, you would, you'd adhere to Reformed theology or? We're a lot more Reformed than let's say the Episcopal Church, but okay. we're also, I mean, Anglicanism is like the via media between Catholicism and Protestantism. Yeah. So there's a lot of, you know, Catholic elements and there's a lot of Protestant elements. Well, the too. liturgy per, per se, right? The liturgy is Catholic, but even some of our theology in general. But, yeah. Yeah. Like, like, but what would you say is like, how is someone saved? Through faith alone. Through faith alone. Okay, so it's but not... we also, we believe, there's an important distinction, we believe that you're saved through faith alone, but a faith without works is dead faith. So it's right. not the works itself that saves you. Faith, faith is never alone. alone. Faith never comes alone. Yes. Right. But it's not, yeah, it's not that distinction is key, right? Like yeah. So it's not the, the the works that save. It's the faith in Christ that saves. But genuine faith will produce works. Exactly. And that's why they tell you, you will know them by their fruit. Yeah. And, and that's what James is speaking on a level like you and me. Like, I'll show you my faith by my works. You know what I mean? So, and that's the Anglican position. And even like the Episcopal Church, like that's their position. Just you know, uh -huh. gets in general. So yeah. Yeah, but just over the years, I know like a lot of a lot of denominations. I mean, I'm 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 a Reformed Baptist, 1689 guy. So that's I hold to the 1689 Confession, uh, yeah. um, which is an adaptation. Like it, it's Westminster Presbyterians say we just copied over their shoulder, you know, when we wrote it down. But there's some distinctions that we have in it because we're Baptists. We believe in baptizing believers. Where I don't know, Anglican, you baptize babies? Okay, so yeah, you still have that aspect. But not for what? Not for the removal of sin, right? Or how do you guys go about it? Because you so, don't believe in baptismal regeneration, right? Well, or do you? We believe baptism for the forgiveness of sins, yeah. We, in the Nicene Creed, like when it says one baptism for the forgiveness of sin, right? because that traces back to the early church. So like we retain, basically we retain the same beliefs and practices of the early church, the undivided church, so up until... You know, the, the first schisms. schism, right. we have everything that they had before then, at least when all of Christianity could agree on that, apart from, like, you know, obvious heresies, historianism, all that sort of stuff. But, like, the actual teachings of the undivided church is what we go by. And because baptism being practiced as a sacrament, and also the Nicene Creed being developed, obviously, at the Council of Nicaea, and then the idea of infant baptism was also present in the early church, so we still preserve that, yeah. I know yeah, because they carry over for that. They see it as the sign, because even my Presbyterian brothers see it as a sign of the circumcision. So that was circumcision in the Old Testament. Then you have that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, as a Baptist, obviously, we don't baptize babies, but yeah. we have our own issues I with. I always find that kind of ironic, just the Baptist of. But yeah. Well, we have our own issues because we do baptize people that are unregenerate, right? Yeah. Not that we know it, because they make the profession, yeah. right? But then. They either apostatize or walk away from but the that's faith. That's the same or, position as the Anglican Church. Yeah. So like when but, well, baptize, well, but same position to an extent, right? My, my name is Ricky, by the way. I'm John. Nice to John, you. it's really nice talking to you. But the um the, the difference though would be, would be where I'm trying to understand. It, you're saying that baptism saves, 
as Peter even says, it's not the washing of the way of the field. It's not, it's not the water aspect that saves. Or I know with Roman Catholicism, they say that when they baptize these babies, it's, a, it's a washing away that original sin. Yes. Like, that's gone. Yeah. Right? Where we would say, no, that you're still under the effect of the original sin until Christ changes the heart. Because well, under the new covenant... It's under the effect of original sin, but it's the actual, let's say, the penalty for the... So, again, I'm not Catholic, but right. I'm familiar. I went to Catholic school my whole life. I'm familiar with Catholicism. Um, so there's uh, something called conspicuance, if I'm pronouncing it right. Basically, which is the tendency to sin. So after there was original sin, we all have a tendency as human, as a fallen human nature, the tendency to sin, right? So when you're baptized, you remove like the actual sin, but you still have that tendency to sin, which is why obviously you know even baptized people will end up sinning. Like it isn't just because you're baptized doesn't mean you won't sin. Um, the Anglican belief about baptism, similar to what you were saying about how you might baptize someone that's unregenerate, but you not know that, right? So the Anglican belief is not that baptism itself is some magic like uh, formula type thing. Yeah, or something. that'll automatically save anyone. Because it has to be received by faith. Like, all sacraments have to be received by faith. So it's possible that there's, like, a distinction between... Well, that, reconcile that for me then, right? I know yeah. you're going to finish that off, so hopefully I'm not, like, throwing okay. you up. But reconcile that with me. If it has to be received by faith, mm -hmm. an yeah, infant I, cannot oh, acknowledge cool. or make that, yeah. that acknowledgement of that faith. Yeah. So reconcile that for me. Maybe that's where you were headed. I don't know, but yeah. I'm just... So the idea, specifically with infants, is that if you look at, like, the the right for baptizing an infant, it'll be like the parent or the godparent that'll, like the text literally says like, do you promise like raise them up in a certain way and like, you know, raise them in the Christian race, right? And it would be the parent or like godparent or guardian or whoever on behalf of the child, right? So it's not that, it's something that, see I have to explain like all of like sacramental theology and then it's the whole big thing. But basically, we see, and the same thing with, like, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, LCMS, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're the more solid one. The other yeah. one's more liberal. Yeah. yeah. But they, like, share the same beliefs on, like, sacrament stuff as, like, the Anglicans. Okay. Or very similar, at least. Um, so the way that they reconcile it, basically, is that... Um, sorry, I'm being distracted. Oh. Hi, wait for me to... It's your group? Um, what? It's your group you're with? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the way that we see baptism, because yes, you're referencing the verse in Peter, like, you know, it's not the washing away that sins, right? So we see baptism not as a work, but we see it as a work of God, right, that you receive in faith, right? So yes, infants can't receive it in faith at that particular moment that they're baptized, but it's something for them later. And we also believe that because it's a work of God and because, you know, Jesus himself commanded baptism, that like with the original sin and with the other sacramental graces. So it's a grace, right, that'll help you later come to faith. But just having a baptism alone, if you have no faith or if you go out and live, you know, the way you want to, don't have faith, that, don't have that actual faith in Jesus Christ, don't have that relationship, and the baptism is not going to save you, right? So it ultimately is on the onus of the person getting baptized to receive that in faith for the sacrament to be effective. But the sacrament itself is still a work of God because it's the way... And it's simply God's way, because that's what Jesus said. It's his way of imparting a specific grace on us. And the idea of having, like, parents or godparents speak on behalf of the children is one that we see, like, with Paul um, when he was in jail, right, if you remember. Um, in Acts, where he, where he says, you know, when the Philippian jailer says, you know, he comes to his house and he says yeah. it's him and his household. Yeah. It doesn't say, though, that he had kids. Well, it doesn't. It, it, it says it his says, household, but I get what you're saying. I know that's the same thing. For yeah. kids, it does say that many will be saved because of his faith, and like later, um, well, Paul well, it says they, about... that he taught these things and they believed, right? So, I mean, the, the the qualifying verses I think are after that. Like, I don't, I don't. Again, I I have Presbyterian brothers that I love that are Christians. Yeah. I don't think it's a separating thing yeah. unless you're going into heretical things. But I I, I think it's interesting because um, Baptists do the same thing with baby dedications. Yeah. In a sense, like I always tell, like I joke. Because I, being a Reformed Baptist, I'm not really, I mean, I, they all, a lot of people do it, but I say, all we're missing is the water, because we're basically doing the same thing, yeah. right? Although, I still would, would disagree in the aspect of that faith is that it is Christ that, that gives us the faith, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, yeah. you know, faithfulness, it's really, if you look at it, it's faith, like the Spirit is giving us these, this gift, yeah. you know, and so, 
salvation, and obviously if you're Reformed, then you would agree with the doctrines of grace, I think. You know, I know Lutherans are kind of, but you're saying you're more along that. Well, we were the middle way. Okay, so, so you, well, you understand TULIP, you know, like total depravity, unconditional election. Are you, are you kind of like... I'm in the middle in that too. In the middle, okay. Um, Usually what, limited atonement? Well, I want to say in the middle, not just like in the middle of like only believe half of them, but even some of the aspects I might believe, but maybe not half. Like I don't believe in necessarily total depravity. I do believe in depravity, just not total depravity, I would say. I don't believe that, to my knowledge, I don't think that's a official profession of the Anglican faith, but just from what I've researched, I've looked at Catholic arguments, I've looked at the Protestant arguments, for it, I think that when God created us, he made it very distinct, that humans are very good, like we're the only ones that describe right. as very good. And I would say that sin, the entrance of sin leads to depravity, but I would still say that sin alone would not lead to total depravity, because I think it would be very hard for humans to do something that would like completely undo the work of a perfect, infinite God. So yes, there can be depravity, but not total depravity. Now, I know that total depravity has also been used to explain like how you know sinful humans can't choose yeah. to be good on their own. That's why you need Jesus and salvation. That I can agree with, but I think it's more of the terminology, whether... Well, know, yeah, it usually comes down to the argument of can people choose God? It comes down to do they have the ability. That's usually where it comes down yeah. to, right? So it, do you have the ability? And it's been debated for many, many a year. See, my, it might be a cop, but answer, my answer to that is that... I guess we'll never know, because I would say that God always seeks us. Even in Revelation, it says Jesus knocking the door of our hearts. We're well, the that's a church, hands. though. But that's a church. Yeah. He's speaking to a church. He's knocking at the door of that church. Um, but I, I agree. I think this is why I think the Reformed faith, whether it be Anglican, you know, and again, I would have to look more deeper into I mean, the some, thing. It's not but that's yeah, but like the Reformed faith, I think not that anybody has perfect theology, right? Yeah. But has the most they deal with the most issues as honestly, I think, as they can. Because I do believe man doesn't have the ability to come to God. I mean, John 1.13 tells us that they don't, like, all who receive him, he gives them the right to become the children of God, John 1.12. Yeah. But he says, but they don't do this of their of the bloodline, of their, their flesh, which is their works, or of their own will. Yeah. And so I think the scriptures do teach that. Um, however, I think with Reformed theology, we don't, we don't try to, re well, we, we do try to reconcile, but we don't try to... We see the, the, the fact that man still is making decisions and chooses in accordance to their will. God so changes that, that will. Calvinist just... Well, yes. I'm not afraid of the term. Um, I know some people don't like to use the term because they think it associates you with John Calvin yeah. necessarily. But it just as far more of a Pauline kind of guy, okay. you know, because I think what Calvin was doing, and actually the, the, the Calvin, the five points came after Calvin, like 30 some years, or maybe even 50 years after Calvin, I think it was 35 or something like that, okay. and so, but he still would have held to those those positions, um, but that was just a response to the Arminian, Jacob Arminius, and those five points of Arminianism, yeah. so it was really just this response, and like with total depravity and things, I do think that man is not utterly depraved, they still do things, and I think it shows the communicable attributes of God in them yeah. by doing those things created in the image of God. Exactly. However, we're going to go sit over there just so you know. Take your time. Okay. But, but uh, um, I don't think that man can choose God on their own. Nobody that comes to Christ doesn't come freely. Yeah. But the thing is, Christ changes the heart, and he, so he changes your desire. And I, I, It's a bad analogy because analogies break down, but I try to use when I'm explaining it to them is like, if you love broccoli, or you love uh, ice cream, it just tastes great, and you don't want nothing to do with broccoli, and God changes your taste bud. Now that broccoli is appealing. You, you can't not but want that, and you don't want the other thing. Yeah. And it's an analogy. They break down, so people could poke holes in it. But my point is that when I'm trying to get it across is you do freely come. When, you, when Christ changes your, your heart and gives you that new heart, when what is born again, regeneration, Ezekiel 36, yeah. what's happening is God now is, is allowing you to see him in his glory, in his beauty, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, you don't want to reject it. You won't reject it. It is irresistible. because Not because you want to reject it. You just won't. You're seeing the beauty of Christ. You know what I mean? And so, um, But you freely come because now you see it. You hear the gospel and you come. Right? Um, but God has to be the one that does that work. He's the author and finisher of our faith. You know what I mean? So, 
so we would argue, and I know, again, like I was saying, to explain the entire sacrament of history, it's like a lot of backstory, so I'm not sure how familiar you are with it. But, like I was saying, the sacraments we see as, so the way that we commonly describe it as uh, a visible sign of an invisible grace. Okay. Right? So, it's not that the sacrament itself, like Peter says, not the washing of the water itself, right? But that is the sign of an invisible grace. So we see it as a work of God. So whether it's the Eucharist, whether it's baptism, even things like, you know, matrimony, marriage, or like, uh, you know, uh, heal it, like communion for the sick, right? We see that not as like the physical means at which God told us to perform that as like having power itself, but rather that is simply the way that God bestows the grace. So like similar to, um, if you go in the Old Testament, like the story with, uh, what was it, Nathan and Elisha, Elijah? Or Laban, where he had to dip in the water seven times. Oh, to yeah, be yeah, healed. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> like, it's not the water didn't heal him, right? But simply the obedience part <laughs> was telling him to dip in the water seven <laughs> times. And once he did that, you know, he actually was able to receive God's grace. But it wasn't the water itself that healed him. That was just me. So we see the sacraments as God's, like, sign of obedience. Like, it's the way that God has taught us to do those things. And that's the way that God imparts his grace, not necessarily only. But like that's one of the ways, the most common way at least, that God imparts His grace. But it's not the physical things itself. Like the water's not magic. The water's a bad right. not magic or anything. So do you have the same amount of sacraments as the Roman Catholic Church, or? <clears throat> so the Anglican Church distinguishes between the sacraments that the Roman Catholics do. So we have the same amount, but we have a distinction in that there's only two that we say is like are required, as in Jesus Baptism instituted and them baptism and the Eucharist okay. and then the other five we do have when we practice but we don't necessarily make them as required as because obviously not everyone's going to get married not everyone's going to become a priest right so like holy orders and matrimony are like well they don't married, have you don't you don't do the like priesthood as the same as Roman Catholicism right like your priest Anglican priest married or they can't marry they do they can marry yeah okay so yeah that's what I was you know because yeah. I know that they, that's completely off the table. Yeah, well, it's another thing as to us, like, going back to the original history, because originally priests could get married. Right, right. Until, like, the 600s with uh, Pope Gregory the Great yeah. who did the reforms. Um, yeah, so, like, like even uh, confession, for example, like, we believe that you can pray directly to God and receive forgiveness for your sins, for any sin, whether it's, we don't necessarily distinguish between mortal and venial, but um, we believe you can pray directly to God, but also there's a sacrament of confession as well, whereas in Catholicism, if you commit, you know, a mortal sin, in order to be forgiven, you have to go to confession. Like, you can't just pray like mm -hmm. venial sins you can, but you can't, you can't do that for a mortal sin. So, like, we don't have that same distinction. So, we do, yes, have the same sacraments, but we place different levels on them, and we understand them a bit differently than uh, Catholics do. Yeah. Yeah, even in the Reformed, you know, uh, Baptist Church, we do believe in means of grace. Obviously, we only have the two ordinances, yeah. baptism and the Lord's Supper. Right, um, but we do see the preaching as a means of grace, you know, gathering together, the fellowship of the believers, the encouragement as one of the means when you come together. Yeah. I mean, and there is something, there is something spiritual at work when you come together as the body and sit under the preaching of God's word as opposed to listening to something online. You still may learn from it, you still may grow from it, it still may uh, benefit you and encourage you, but there's something spiritual and powerful about being together yeah. and receiving, having those means of grace present. You know what I mean? Um, it's just something supernatural that, like, you can't, you can't manufacture that yeah, outside of that. This yeah. is what God's means by which he builds the church and, and edifies the church and encourages the church is through the church, so. Yeah. You know, but yeah. I do have one question quickly because I know sure. you're talking about um, baptism and like baptism of infants and such. Um, and we're talking like the history of it in, in Bible context. So I guess one question I have for like um, like reformed people, right? Like fully reformed, because obviously again, Anglican draws traditions, maybe not sure, sure. completely. Um, how do you respond to? certain things that like that aren't necessarily in dispute like you know infant baptism in particular but certain things that have been like historically practiced that we know of like in the early church like even by people that either the apostles themselves or people that were taught by the apostles right like that tradition basically like when you see it gone in later 
Protestantism today? Like, how do you, like, I know obviously Catholics, for example, will place like scripture and tradition on like the same pedestal, but Protestants, you know, it's uh, sola scriptura, right? right? <clears throat> but like, do you have any, like, what's your regard for tradition, I guess? Um, well, I grew up in an independent fundamentalist Baptist church, right. you know, and they'd always speak out against Roman Catholicism, which I, I would agree. We speak out. I don't, I don't think that what they preach is biblical Christianity, right? Because it is faith plus works. Now, I know they will try to, you know, say that it's not, but I don't think you can get away from it because their council says it, you know. Well, However, I mean, but, I mean, we could get into that. But I, but I always caught me off guard because I'm always like, we say about these traditions, but we're a fundamental traditional Baptist church, so we have our own traditions. Yeah. The thing is, though, we never put the tradition, uh, and I'm a Reformed Baptist now, but we still don't put tradition over the Scripture. So, because we, we both could probably agree, you go back to some of the early church fathers, take Origen, for instance, who had a lot of problems theologically, you know, with a lot of allegorically, the way that he understood things and interpreted things. There's even some that we would say, well, we don't see, basically that's why the scripture has to be the authority. Because there may be church fathers in the past who did things that didn't agree with other church fathers, and then you get Augustine coming in and trying to, you know, say, yeah. look, here's what the scriptures are saying in, in all these areas. Um, and then you kind of lose it over time, but then there's kind of like, even with the Reformation, they're kind of bringing it back and saying, we gotta go back to the scripture. Because even with Roman Catholicism, and I think we would agree, as you said, and it wasn't until the 600s, it wasn't all, actually a lot of stuff started coming in after the 4th century yeah. of what they were then adding to practice and making it tradition, right? And so those things aren't necessarily bad, traditions aren't necessarily bad, so long as they don't contradict the scripture. Yeah. So that's why, like for me, if somebody could show me in the scripture where they're taking, I understand how Presbyterians do it and Anglican and, and Catholic may be, may be similar in that as far as taking the circumcision to be baptism. But I see lots of types in the Old Testament, and the ultimate type of that circumcision was the circumcision of the heart, which is even mentioned in the Old Testament. Well, yeah. Like, you, you need that, that real circumcision. Both. I think that there's often a misunderstanding of Catholic, and I guess by extension Anglican, belief on baptism, whereas some make it out to be like, or some perceive it as like, you baptize an infant, that infant is saved, like, you know, no matter what, like, the magic formula has just been done, right. that infant's saved, like, you know, but that's not how we understand it, it still has to be received by heart. So there's, like I was saying, like, it's a means of grace, right, but your heart still matters. So there's the actual action, so if you compare that to circumcision, right, there's obviously the actual act of getting circumcised, but then there's, of course, circumcision of the heart. And that's why also, Anglicans, Catholics, and I believe Orthodox as well, have they baptize infants, but they also have the sacrament of confirmation as well, which is, whereas for some Protestants, maybe when you get baptized, also when you receive the Holy Spirit, in Catholicism or in Anglicanism or in uh, uh, Orthodoxy, right, it doesn't necessarily, when you get baptized, not necessarily when you receive the Holy Spirit, there's a separate sacrament, which is confirmation, which at that point is when, you know, the child has grown up and is, or I guess adults, because they get confirmed too, is grown up and is actually able to make that conscious choice. So we just see baptism as sort of a mark of that grace of God that, yes, wipes away original sin, but also as a profession from the parents or godparents, whoever's raising the child, to, you know, raise them in the faith, right? It's a means of God's grace. And then separately, once the child has their own personal faith, they're able to make that profession of their faith, confirmation, and then they can receive the Holy Spirit, I call it like a baptism of the Holy Spirit is separate, you know, from the water baptism. So, I would say that it's similar to what you said about like dedication of babies, except, you know, we understand it's an actual sacrament and we view it as an actual valid baptism as well, but we do, it, that's like not, that's not the end all, like, right, right. of the initiation, we do also have confirmation as well. Right. And like in some, like in Catholicism, for example, like even other sacraments that you have to be Catholic to receive, you have to be baptized and Catholic to receive, you can't receive until you've been confirmed, like the Eucharist and stuff. You can't be, you can't receive the Eucharist until you've gotten your first confirmation and stuff. So, um, yeah, I would say it's also a bit of nuance with the way that we understand baptism versus how, you know, some Protestant groups might understand yeah. baptism as well. Well, we see, well, we see that it's not at baptism that someone receives the Holy Spirit, they receive it at sal at the moment of belief, yeah. at faith. But I mean, some, so, not necessarily you in particular, but there are some Protestant groups that do believe that. 
Yeah, well, yeah, there, there's charismatics I know that do, like Pentecostal, yeah. kind of, because they believe that you get this baptism of the Spirit that comes later. Yeah. But we, we believe that it's it's when one believes, they're given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, as it says in Ephesians, right? They have all been, it's been given to them. The Spirit is now indwelling in them. Now, I understand, I know a lot of times what they do with that is they'll say, well, you know, in Acts, you see... The Spirit comes upon these people, and then later, when when they come to the uh, uh, Samaritans, is it the Samaritans? Yeah. Then they they they, uh, they receive this gift. But there was this transitional kind of period where the Spirit would come upon people, but not indwell people, as this new thing that happens in this new covenant. So the there was Old a huh? Same thing in the Old Testament. Yeah, well, they wasn't indwelled with the Spirit, yeah, but they were, saying, they yeah, would yeah, they would come upon them, yeah. but now this is the Spirit, yeah, yeah, so there was a new thing happening that wasn't the same, um, so I think with that transition, that's what we're seeing, where the, the apostles are the ones that are showing, like, the same thing that come to us now is coming to these Gentiles, well, coming to the Samaritans, then coming to the Gentiles, right, um, so, yeah, I don't know, so when you said that you guys believe that the Spirit comes after so you get. I mean, there's like. A but at the so so spirit. at the confirmation, that person is 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 acknowledging. I believe in everything that I was taught, being raised yeah. by my parents or godparents. I believe it, and I'm I've received Christ. Yeah. And so, then, they're receiving the Holy Spirit when they're believing. Yes. Right. Right. So I think we would we would agree. Obviously, it's just the only thing is where that baptism falls in. Right. Yeah. And so, I don't know, it's good, it's it's good conversation, man. How old are you? I'm 19. Well, man, you're sharp. I love researching about theology. Yeah, you're, you're sharp for a 19-year-old. I, I appreciate the conversation. Thank you, I appreciate it. That's good. It Most of the time, you know, young kids don't, uh, they are a young man, but young, young, young people don't really put that much stock into the things of God. So, uh, yeah. this is encouraging. Yeah. You know, I appreciate the dialogue. Yeah, thank you, you for know. what you're doing, too. Yeah.